I've got three portions of scripture to bring to you this morning. The first one is from the book of Revelation, chapter 8. I will be reading from verse 12 to chapter 9, verse 1. It's not a long portion of scripture, but it says during this, this scripture was written during a time of tribulation. The fourth, the, the fourth angel is being spoken of and it said, and the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten and a third part of the moon and a third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise. Did anybody ever read this before and just pass by? The night likewise, the night, the reflection, he's ref the reflection of moonlight was one third less at night. So one third of the light from the sun, one third of the light from the moon and the stars is darkened. So during this sermon, if you would recall the word darkness, and this darkness that he's talking about is an end time environment. You may be seated. Now I'd like you to turn with me to Isaiah 58, 8. Then shall thy light, somebody say thy light. One more time break then shall thy light break forth as the morning and thine health shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness shall go before thee the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward now I want to draw your attention to another word the word break it's used here in our scripture about light breaking. Now I want to bring your attention to 2 Peter 1, 2, first part. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. I want to draw your attention to the word multiply. Remember three words in this sermon in this sermon darkness the word break and the word multiply darkness and light play a big part in the biblical narrative light is the very first thing that God creates and it describes everything and every attribute of God in scripture I'm telling you God's word amen is even called the light it's a light to the path of believers. Jesus calls himself the light of the world. Then he tells us that each saint of God is like a candle in a dark room or a well-lit city on a hill. And there are over, I look, there are over a hundred scriptures that talk about God's people being light. Can, we, can you say light? From our text, grace peace and knowledge are all aspects of God's nature, which according to God's word, like I said, are considered light in darkness. God's truth is considered light. God's grace, his love, all his attributes are considered light. So if we transposed our second verse in 2 Peter, it would sound something like this, light plus light be multiplied in you through the light of Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, light allows what was invisible before to be seen. It, it allows things that are not seen to be seen, to be looked at, to be perceived, to be understood. But the Bible tells me that the last days are going to be a time of darkness. The book of Revelation tells us 
It would be great darkness in the earth. And the Bible tells us that it would be a darkness that's getting darker. But it also says that the light would shine brighter. And there's many scriptural prophetic words that prophesy great darkness in the earth. And, and what it's talking about is a sin-tolerant environment, an offended environment. But even more, even though this sin-tolerant darkness and is happening, there is more mention that light and glorious things are, are going to happen, and God is going to release great light. So why do we expect darkness to get darker? Well, here's the verse where this comes from. It's Isaiah 60, verse 2, the first part. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. Now, some translations say gross darkness. This verse says darkness is getting darker. Now, this is talking about the people's hearts. You see, gross darkness, the people. This is talking about a culture that welcomes sin. Much like Sodom, immorality runs rampant. Abortion is winked at. Young girls are openly exploited. The culture is dark that the scripture is talking about. It's sensuous. It's evil. It's against God. Gross darkness. And over the people's understanding is deep darkness. But here's the kicker. The rest of the verse assumes that light is getting brighter. Check out Isaiah 60, verse 2, the last part of it. But the Lord, somebody say, but. I love this. But the Lord, what, will rise over you, and his glory will see, be seen where? Upon you. Point at your neighbor. That means you. His glory is light. Do you see the dichotomy here? The contrast. Now, in nature, the only thing that causes darkness to perpetually consume space into more darkness is this phenomenon known as a black hole. They still don't know a whole lot about it, but what they do know is that a black hole is a place in space that gravity is so inwardly drawn and so strong that light can't even escape it. Black holes contrast stars like the sun because the sun also has gravity, it has great gravity. If you get too close to the sun, you can't get away. I mean, have you ever seen Star Trek? I mean, they tried to get around the sun one time and it almost sucked them in. Thank God Captain Kirk made it. But, folks, the sun has something that a black hole doesn't. Amen. It releases light. Even though it has great gravity, light breaks free of its own gravity, and it never runs out of light to give. And light is a wave. It wants to travel, and it can only be broken by being refracted when it runs into a perfected prism, releasing a rainbow of color. Amen. But a lot of folks in the church and a lot of folks that call themselves Christians and a lot of well-intentioned people, you know, they read their Bible and they sit there in their living room and they just get critical of the times. You know, things are dark. Or I just hate this, this old world. I've had enough of this old world. They cr get a little crotchety little negative, but you know, it's all in the name of God, just because I love all the good stuff of God. You know, I just hate this old world. I just wish Jesus would come. I'm sick of everything going on around here. You guys quiet. You know somebody, you just don't want to look. I got to stare straight forward. But the Holy Ghost began to speak to me. Darkness is getting darker. Yes. 
But God's people and many well-intentioned saints, instead of being positive and full of faith in this end time and in this great darkness, amen, they're getting negative and they're not realizing, amen, that God has a principle of light and darkness. You don't understand, and because you don't understand, your ignorance is causing you to neglect your presence as light in this world. Jesus, the light of the world, fills you with his spirit, and the spirit of Jesus Christ is refracted through you, through your good works. Somebody say hallelujah. He said your good works are going to glorify, they're going to explode light in darkness. We have never had a greater opportunity to reach the lost than we do right now. They have never been more lost. They've never been more undone. They've never been more messed up. The Spirit of the Lord gave me a vision and a dream when when the Lord gave me the name of this church. And he showed me all the classes that would be going on in this building way before I ever built it. And he showed me this. He said, my people... And the world around them, they don't know how to be families anymore. They don't know how to love each other anymore. They don't know how to be light. Teach them. This angel's taking me through the rooms. And there were so many classes going on. People were getting parenting classes and divorce recovery and, and, and family life classes and learning how to become what God has called them to be. And the Spirit of God spoke to me. This is where this church is heading. Amen. This is not a time to get depressed because of the darkness. This is your time to shine. This is time to raise up your hands and say, hallelujah, I'm going to be light. Check this out. Isaiah 60, verses 3 through 5. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar, and your daughter shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant. And your heart shall swell with joy because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. I love this. There's so much darkness. But the scripture continues with amazing promises, all based on the fact that the Lord will in the future rise over you. Somebody say hallelujah. His glory will be seen upon you and then you will be light. Amen. On the day of Pentecost, amen, 120 were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And great light exploded in that room, cloven tongues like as a fire. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. They put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light, poke at your neighbor and say, that means you. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let me tell you, and maybe in the 1800s, you know, maybe across a prairie town in Nebraska, right, you'd walk into town, and everybody looked pretty good, and, and maybe most of the folks were pretty wholesome except for the brothel downtown that nobody went to and they didn't understand how they stayed in business you know that's how I read in history here recently amen you know everybody was very pious you know and did you know in the 1800s the average person American the average person 90 percent of the average people in America It was a huge number, had basic biblical knowledge. It was like amazing how much they knew about the Bible. Today, I'm telling you, it has never been so low. From what I understand, it's less than 40%. I got people that I know that I love very dearly that have no biblical knowledge, never heard about Jonah and the ark. I'm just kidding. Never heard about Moses. Never heard about Noah. 
I'm telling you. I'm looking in the faces of people that I love, and they don't know. Never heard. Weren't, didn't grow up with it. What are you saying? This lack of knowledge. Remember, he said, with the knowledge of our God. This lack of knowledge is darkness. Why do you think they called it the dark ages? Because people weren't reading their Bibles. They didn't have the light of God's word. But hallelujah, I'm here to tell you, if you st stay self-focused and negative and turn inward on yourself and say, you know what, this whole world can go to the blazes and, and you know what, this place is just so nasty and everybody's just so black and I hate this old world. You talk like that, you don't have the heart of Christ. Jesus loved the world while we were yet sinners. He died for it. Amen. Jesus loved the world so much that he bore all the sins of this world to a cross. And if you become a black hole and you just become self-focused, darkness will get darker in your corner of the world. Spend all your time on, ne on negative subjects, talking about what you're against instead of what you're for. You hear me? Jesus said, if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. When people fall in love with Jesus, they're going to start keeping his commandments. You don't have to beat them up all the time over it. You just got to get them to fall in love with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And once they meet him, he's, he's absolutely amazing. And they'll love him. And it'll be a positive response. I can't help but love what God loves. I can't help but hate what he hates. But he loves the world. So as we receive re revelation from God, we become refracted light. When Brother Casey shows love to a stranger, you hear me? He is refracting love. When Brother Giovanni reaches out his hand and helps a neighbor, he is showing love. He's refracting the lie of love. When you help and you give and you testify to the grace of God in you and you tell people that are in a mess or that are hungry to know the Lord and you share your testimony, you are refracting light. Every warning from God, and I, I researched the scriptures, and I was going to have some brothers help me with this, but I, I couldn't get to it. But every warning from God that I could find of darkness, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, it always is an invitation for the faithful to break out. There's a, here's this prophecy of darkness, and every single time there's an invitation for light. The book of Revelation starts with darkness, but it reminds us that there is hope beyond the trials of this life. And one day Jesus is going to split the eastern sky. Amen. He's coming. Amen. And I got hope beyond this life. Amen. And darkness will pass away entirely. And the Bible says I'm going to live in perpetual light because Jesus is the light there. So how do we get to this place? I mean... Some of you got personality deficits because of the way you're raised. You're sweet, you're well-intentioned, but you're broken. You're severely broken. The training you receive from the dysfunctional families you were raised in, the painful environments you were in, situations that you had no control over, the abuses that you took, maybe some of the addictive nature that you have and you've taken some things into yourself and now you're broken. The Word of God brought me, the Spirit of God brought me to this Word, Micah 2.13. The breaker is come up before them. This is a prophecy of what Messiah would be called and at the same time what he would do. The breakers come up before them. They have broken up. They have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them. And the Lord, somebody say the Lord, on the head of them. That means he's in charge of this brokenness. Amen. And the Spirit of God is saying, Amen. It's not only okay that you're here and you're broken, that He wants to take the place of your brokenness, your dysfunction, your failure, your addiction, this darkness. 
for us to shine, we must first be broken at the feet of the breaker. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, help me to describe broken people from a spiritual context. And I, I went into the word and I began to break down the spiritual context of brokenness. And this is what I came up with and from studying the word. I, I wrote it down in, in a Dieter phrase. Broken people are humble. Nothing more, nothing less. They're in total agreement with God. Broken people are teachable. Broken people are forgivers. They let things go real easy. Broken people know that they can't do anything of real eternal value in their own strength. Broken people are open and honest. Broken people are truth seekers. Broken people have laid down their rights in front of God. And they say, God, you are right all the time. Broken people love everyone without strings attached. Broken people don't have to know everything. They rest in Jesus and they trust that he always knows. And if he chooses to, he'll let them know when he deems fit. And this scripture is their mantra. Second Chronicles 20, verse 12. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Anybody been there? Any broken people in here today? Raise your hands. I've mentioned this in the past, but there's an ancient Hebrew phrase that rabbis long past have quoted throughout the years, which they believe identified them as special before God. And they believe, many ancient rabbis believe that this is why God chose Israel above all the nations of the earth, was this one phrase. Now, Aseah Vanishma. We will do, and then we will understand. I want you to raise your hands, and if any attribute, amen, could be desired in your heart, would you raise your hands high and say, God, fill me. Fill me, Lord. I want to be broken in your hands. So in Jesus' name, I just, I give it all to you. I trust you, Lord. I want to be teachable and humble, Lord. I, I don't want to rely on my own strength, Lord. I, I just want to be open and honest before you, Lord. I want the truth, and, and, and I don't have to be right, Lord. I don't have any rights here. I'm just submitted to you, God. I don't, I don't know everything, Lord. I'm just going to rest in you. Would you all take that deep breath right now? Let it out slow. Would you say it with me in the Lord? Do I place my trust? I want to check out this word break. It's in our first text, Micah 2.13. The Hebrew word for breaker is to break out. That's exactly the definition of light in the sun. Amen. When I looked out, looked it up, and I seen this light breaking forth. From the sun, I looked it up and I talked about, I, I researched how the sun's gravity is pulling light back. But light breaks forth from gravity of the sun to light all this beautiful earth that we inhabit. And the Holy Ghost began to speak to me. My people will be multiplied where they are broken. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed for people with cancer and God has healed them. I've often wondered about it. I said, Lord, I don't understand how that has happened. But I can't tell you how many people I've prayed for that had cancer that it stopped, that it disappeared. It's countless. It was reversed. And the Lord began to speak to me about the different things and 
in all the different places in my life where I've had trouble, God has multiplied and caused me to have power in those areas where I could lay hands on people and touch marriages and touch and help folks in very specific places. Amen. Because God multiplied where I was broken. In Mark chapter 6, verse 30, and you can read all the way through verse 44, and I'm not going to read the chapter. I'm going to tell you the story. Jesus and his disciples had this enormous crowd, and they're following him into the wilderness, and the day is wearing on. There's no Arby's, there's no Chick-fil-A, and they're in a pickle. They got thousands of people out in the wilderness, and they're hungry. The disciples realize this is happening, and they come to Jesus and say, Lord, we got a problem. We have no food to feed these people. Send them away. There was a little boy, and you know the story. He has a small lunch, a couple fish, some bread. And he offers his lunch to Jesus. Jesus commands the disciples to set the people down in groups, and they sat down in the field. All these thousands of people. Now remember, the disciples wanted Jesus to tell them to scram. Get out of here. Go home. Feed yourself. But the Bible says this little boy had an offering. He takes his offering, the Lord, and gives it to the Lord, and the Lord receives the offering. I want you to see this. And the next thing he does is he blesses the bread, and then he breaks the bread. So let me say break. That's what the Bible said. He broke the bread. And as he broke it off, oh, my land. It was at the place of brokenness that multiplication began to happen. And as he broke it off, he put it in the basket and said, bring it to group A. He broke it off, put it in the basket, group B, amen, all the way, amen, around the camp. Everybody was fed at the point of brokenness. Now, some of you have come in here extremely broken, extremely worried, but this is not what God is asking you to do, amen. It's It's at the breaking point of your life that multiplication is loose in the spirit. Malachi 3.10 says, bring to the storehouse a full tenth of what you earn. Test me in this, says the Lord, O powerful. I will open the windows of heaven for you and pour out all the blessings you need. See, there's people that will give, but the Bible says not to give grudgingly. When you give, or whenever you've given in your life, if you gave grudgingly, amen, that is not received of the Lord. I'm doing it because, you know, the Bible says the tenth. Got these bills, and nobody ever helps me. When, where's God? Hush your mouth. The person that gives from a place of brokenness. That little woman that gave her might, Jesus stops the crowd. He's watching. Amen. Talk about embarrassing, right? How would you feel if I stood right here while you were giving and saying, thank you, thank you. Jesus did that. And this little woman, amen, Jesus is here. Here's the basket. And he's standing there watching. Everybody's probably going, what's going on here, Rabbi? And he knows all things. He was God, manifest in flesh. He walks, amen, he's standing there, and everybody's giving. Some with attitude, some with because it's commanded, some because of this. But the little woman came up in brokenness. She gave of her very living. This is all she had was the might. And she takes this might. I have one in my office. And she drops it in the offering basket, and Jesus stops the crowd. Watch this. 
This is a learning time for all of you. Pay attention. He tells the crowd in the temple, this woman gave more than y'all. You see, brothers and sisters, amen, our giving, our brokenness, our tithing, all these things have to come from a spirit of generosity. It has to come from a spirit of love. Amen. When you're holding on to everything in your life like this, you're missing the whole spirit of the Word of God. Brokenness is a spirit. Amen. It's an attitude. It's a place that God cannot resist going. He said a broken and a contrite heart he wouldn't despise. Another place that he won't turn it away. There's nothing that can get in the way of a believer and his Lord when he's broken. When that woman was in a clump at the feet of Jesus, she's just going to take whatever retribution's coming. She's just laying there totally guilty. Everybody's accusing her. She's not standing up pointing her finger. She could have pointed back at one of those boys and said, he was with me. But she didn't. She laid there in a humble clump, and Jesus is is drawn to brokenness. You say, I'm short on time and money. I tell you, give what you have. If you break off your time, talents, or treasure and give it to God, he'll multiply it. See, you can add, but God multiplies. Everything I've ever given to God, anything I've ever done for God, he has given it to me back, pressed down, shaken together, running over. He has taken my, my small offering, and he has multiplied it. I'm looking over my, my ministry and just looking at all the times that God has taken my poultry sum and multiplied it and gave it back to me, pressed down, shaken together. Somebody say hallelujah. And God's saying, listen, I'm shy. Amen. Oh, yeah testify anyway that's not my do it anyway it's not who I am do it anyway my dad became a great soul winner for Jesus Christ and that was not his personality before he got the, the Holy Ghost, that was not his personality. He got a major personality adjustment when he received the baptism of the Spirit. He was changed. And it's ironic to me that God changed him at the point of his brokenness. Here was a very conservative, very conservative, right, European, we just found out, Eastern European, according to Ancestry.com, my dad is very Eastern European, let's just say that. Very regulated, very personalities in check. You don't do anything in public. You don't act a certain way in public. Everybody's appropriate all the time. And here's this man that I knew up to this point at the age of 13 in that way, always together, always controlled. He gets filled with the Spirit. Now he's walking around on his knees, laying hands on everybody, taking trips across country to testify. Everybody that ran into him getting a Bible study, and he don't care who you are, he's going to lay hands on you. Amen. And he is on the prowl every service till now. Anybody ever see him? He's walking around going, Can I, I'm gonna, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There's not a shy bone in his body. You know why? Something got a hold of him at his point of brokenness and changed him. And the Holy Ghost began to speak to me that, yes, this world is dark. Yes, this world is dark. But he is calling us to shine even brighter. Amen. And he's going to empower us through his spirit to be a candle on a lampstand, to be a city set on a hill. We're going to make a statement. We're not here to be done in a corner somewhere. We're here to shine. Now, the Lord has already caused us to break out of our old building. But God has spoke, spoken to me. He said, we got to break out of some empty professions of lip service. Cheap modes of worship. Spiritual shortcuts. 
You talk about being a Christian, but you're full of hooey. I love you, but a Christian isn't part-time. It's not a part-time position. If you're on your job and you've been there for more than a week and they don't know you are a born-again believer in the liberating power of Jesus' name, you've got a problem. I feel the Spirit of God telling me we got to break into a place of brokenness and humility that will birth travailing prayer. Amen. A burden for the lost. Living in loving obedience to the Word. Submission one to another. I'm talking about spontaneous, heartfelt praise and worship. Supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles. See, I know you've been broken. And you've been blaming the devil the whole time. I'm fixing to mess with your theology a little bit. But the Bible tells me in Micah, he's the breaker. The Bible says, if he falls on you, you'll be crushed to powder. If you fall on him, you'll be broken. Say it with me. You say, well, I'm broken, I'm bruised, I'm battered, but you're just broken. You're not crushed to powder. You're not destroyed. I feel the Holy Ghost. Some of you need to begin to look for Jesus because, yes, he is the breaker, but he's going to multiply your resources. Amen. Where you are weak, he's going to make you strong. Where darkness resided, you are a light that's going to shine like an explosion of light. And God says, remember. Look at Isaiah 58, 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be a reward. God didn't put that trial in your life to destroy you. Get this. You know that marriage trouble you had, that disease you've been struggling with, that situation you've gone through? God has called you to multiply. Some of you wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the trial. Some of you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the failure, the addiction, the thing that about destroyed you. I say about. When them psychologists looked at you and said, man, they walked out, when you walked out of the room, they start talking to one another saying, she's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. He's a nutbag. Huh? The doctor looked at you and said, you know what? You're done. Pack your bags. You're going into eternity. That marriage therapist said to you, you know what? Your marriage is over. You need to just split ties. You need to let it go. I'm here to tell you. The Holy Ghost is going to multiply your testimony so your destiny can be changed. I wouldn't be what I was, what I am today if it wasn't for the heartaches of yesterday. I have compassion that kills me sometimes. I wake up in the middle of the night with tears as I pray for people in this building. And I, I literally go down in my, in my basement this morning and I said, Lord. And I begin to groan in the spirit because I felt the love of God so strong for folks here. And I was praying for children. I was praying for marriages. I was praying for spiritual encouragement. And, and, I, and I was just feeling the spirit so strong. And I was thanking God for it. And the Lord showed me, this is where you were broken. Abraham, Genesis 28, 14. He gets a visionary word, and it comes forth about his seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So they say, oh, Abraham's old, and up to this point couldn't have kids. 
And by all accounts, he's done. There's no, no fertility specialists. There's no doctors around that know all about this stuff, right? So how can we be blessed through the seed of Abraham? He has no kids. But Abraham had faith at his breaking point. Somebody here going to get this? His weakness became his strength. And today, every single one of us born-again believers are called children of Abraham. We are children of Abraham by faith. Are you with me, church? The Bible tells me in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Amen. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise promise of the spirit Genesis 3:26 for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ for as many of you as been baptized into Christ baptized there means baptizo in Greek fully submerged into who Christ have put on who Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female for ye are all one in Christ and if ye are Christ uh, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Somebody raise your hands. Brokenness and repentance and obedient faith is Abrahamic spiritual DNA. It's everyone's breaking point. Somebody say hallelujah. You want to be a child of Abraham? You want the promises of Abraham? Just walk in faith. Oh, if somebody could get excited about this. Do you know what's beautiful about brokenness? Is it's not hard. You don't have to have a doctorate, PhD. It doesn't take any special paperwork. It's true. It just takes a clump of human lying before the Lord saying, God, I need you, Jesus. In the O Lord, do I place my trust? I don't know what to do, but my eyes are upon you. Now I say of Anishma, I will do and then understand. Yes, you are Abraham's seed indeed. Check this out. Acts 4.33, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and much grace. Poke your neighbor, say much grace. There were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, the Bible says. And the Bible says because of this brokenness, because of this giving, there was much grace. It wasn't just grace. It was mucho grande grace. Woo! Somebody say great grace. I love it. I need great grace. If you need great grace, raise your hand. When gr much grace showed up, lack disappeared. Much grace banishes poverty. When we are broken, refracted grace multiplies. And every one of us can become a pillar of light in darkness. The other day, the Lord dealt with me to, to help somebody. And I said, Lord, what you're asking me to do is kind of big, and this is going to hurt me. You know, and I, I was more comfortable with this other number, and I gave the other number to the Lord. I did. I didn't even realize what I was doing, but I'm negotiating with the master. I like this number better. That's what I said in my mind to the Lord. And the, and the Lord said, that's not going to help him. This is going to help them. This, 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 isn't, this isn't going to help. So what are you saying? I, I said, thank you, Jesus. So we did it. There's no way that person can ever really bless me back. There's really nothing I'm going to get out of it in, in the physical realm. But the Holy Ghost spoke to me. And you said, what are you talking about? 
when all your resources and my resources are submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ, anything can happen and probably will. I can't tell you what has happened in my life since there. I don't even know what God has for me next. But all I know is multiplied grace. Amen. This is what he said in 2 Peter 1, 2. Grace and peace, light and light, be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of of God. Raise your hands and receive the knowledge of God right now. Amen. Light multiplied. Jesus in us. Hallelujah. Get this. Where we're obedient, uh, we get access to the grace of God. The knowledge of God multiplies it. Light plus light equals multiplied light. I'm closing. I, I just got to give you three principles. One, be willing to change. I've never met an age, I've never preached in an age of more private, right, people. Folks are so, oh, no, 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 you know, they only let you this close. Don't want you. Now you're meddling. Don't get in my business. But the only time we allow him to invade our space is when we're broken. Otherwise, we want to do our own thing. As long as I got a plan, I don't need Jesus. I'm saying you got to change. Two, you got to have an attitude of praise. You never let go of that. Don't get negative. Don't let the negative stuff out of your mouth. Don't talk bad about the past. Don't talk all about what you've been through. Everybody's been through stuff. You're not the only one. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. There's always somebody worse. I was crying, feeling sorry. I can't open my mouth. I can't eat a steak the way I want to. <laughs> You'd be surprised what you can get done when you're hungry. When it's just me and the family, man, or people I'm real close to, I just go. <laughs> but there are times I get a little bummed about it. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me. You know, my, son's, my son-in-law's father took me hunting for antelope the other day and, and we're talking having a great time and the Lord brought to my mind how I feel sorry for myself and that guy will not ask for help he does everything on his own he's only got one arm and he's loading a rifle and he's doing this and he's doing that if it would have been me I'd say hey brother would you do this for me not him he never complains. He's, got, he's so positive. And I was like, Lord, forgive me. Because you know what, folks? There's always somebody that's got something worse than you. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. Start speaking faith. Because that's something we can all do that will change our situation. Okay, and then finally, this is the big deal. Double portion blessing. Be ready. Double portion blessing is the multiplication of light at your brokenness. A double portion deals with inheritance. It's more than natural possession. According to Isaiah 61, 7, it reverses the curse. Instead of your shame, he said you will have a double portion. Somebody receive that. Amen. You deserve shame. Amen. You deserve death. You deserve this and that. But the double portion blessing says instead of that, you get this. And it's because of Jesus' victory over Satan, the thief. The Bible calls him a thief. The double portion is a restoration of what the enemy has stolen from you. Exodus 22, 4. If a thief be caught with a living animal, he is to restore double. How many know the devil is called a thief? Right now, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. I want you to raise your hands and receive this. The double portion is a spiritual heritage of the people of God. And like when Elijah asked for a double portion, a mantle passed from Elijah to Elisha. It represents a marriage of twin anointings, warfare and worship, apostolic and prophetic, building locally, warring globally, community harvest, uh, yet impacting nations, uh, winning souls uh, and equipping for in destiny, reaching the needy and the wealthy, prophesying, but also being a prophetic demonstration, powerful prayer, but also proactive involvement. God says, this is for my people. 
Now I want you to stand. Jesus. I want you to raise your hands and I want you to hear the last part of this sermon. Jesus, at the very first communion service, raise your hands and turn them inward. Turn them inward. That means ancient, that's ancient worship body language. God, I receive. Okay. Receive this. This is my body broken for you. Raise your hands and receive this. I got to get this through to these people. This is my body broken for you. I went, I'm fixing to go through the most painful, excruciating, gruesome death imaginable. I'm going to be nailed to a cross. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be put in a tomb, and I'm going to rise again. And my broken body is going to have a supernatural result that will go throughout the whole world. And I want you to raise your hands a little higher. I want you to receive this. The Bible says, ye are the body of Christ. His broken body has resulted in the multiplied body of Christ throughout the whole world. And that's why I go to Jesus when my whole world is breaking off. God, the breaker, has allowed me to be broken. He's allowed me to be here. And he's going to multiply me here, though. He's not going to leave me there. He's not going to leave me on this sickbed. He's not going to leave me in this brokenness. He is going to multiply me. He's going to lift me up, get me back in the fight. He's going to supply strength. He's available for temptation and for trials. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and he, and he sustains. He guards and he guides and he heals the sick. and He forgives sinners and he discharges debt. He delivers captives. He protects the weak, brothers and sisters. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. His name is Jesus. And he was broken. My life has not always been easy. One of the hardest things I had to accept was that Jesus allowed my brokenness. I want you to get this. What I would have been And what I am today is totally different by the grace of the light of the world, Jesus Christ. He's always been there to wipe away my tears, give me a shoulder to cry on, give me strength when I didn't think I could carry on. I had some gifts, some things I was able to do as a young person. I may have had a few successes if I wouldn't have gone through the valley of sorrows that I've been through. But I'm here today by the grace of God. I went through the valley of the shadow of death. I suffered several, several harsh times but he has never left me. At the point of brokenness in my family, I turn to him and he has multiplied my family. At the point of brokenness in my health, when the doctor said I wouldn't have any more years, he has multiplied the years to me. And the Holy Ghost said, I know there's people here in this room that are broken. And I know life has beat you up. Family dysfunction, addiction, depression, gross darkness, deep darkness. As I was preparing for this sermon, I seen some of your faces and then I seen a dark cloud. And the Lord wouldn't let me see past that dark veil. He just said, he called it darkness. 
And I begin to weep this morning. It's such unbearable pain. Some of you have been through abuse. Some of you are going through financial trouble, emotional problems, stress. And here's the worst one. Self-condemnation. I failed just too many times. But the Holy Ghost said, yes, you're in darkness. And maybe even caught in the act. But the Lord says, come. 